Okay, our next topic is uh, quick sort. Uh, this is another popular sorting algorithm, uh, and this is a randomized algorithm. Okay, more specifically, this is a Las Vegas type randomized algorithm, uh, which means at the end of the execution, you will get the correct output. Okay, the running time of QuickSort in the worst case is quadratic, uh, which is bad. However, the expected running time is big of n log n, okay, which is nice. And therefore, this algorithm is pretty fast in practice. And that is one of the reasons why this algorithm is so popular. In fact, even more popular than some of the you know, algorithms which gives worst case running time of n log n, like Mars wrote. All right, uh, so, okay, so the main strategy is divide and conquer. And what we do is the following. The first step is to pick one of these n numbers randomly and call it the pivot, okay? Now, once I get the pivot, I want to kind of rearrange the elements in this array as follows. I want all the numbers smaller than the pivot should go to the left side, basically should go before the pivot, then you have the pivot, and all the numbers which are larger than the pivot should go after the pivot. After means towards the right side. So this way I want to rearrange the array, the elements in the array. And once I finish this rearrangement, which I can do it in um, um, all of n time, then I can view this array as the following, a left subarray, with everything smaller than the pivot, a right subarray with everything larger than or equal to the pivot. Now, all I'm going to do is repeat the same process, right, recursively on both the left subarray as well as the light subarray. And it is very easy to see why this works because each time you are kind of achieving some sort of ordering. So at the end of the day, you will get the correct answer. Okay, now let's see this more formally uh, and I am going to use this small array as a running example. So first step is this, select a pivot, pivot randomly, okay, or randomly or more specifically uniformly at random, which means the following, which means the probability that you are going to pick any one of these elements should be the same, okay? The probability that you will pick this element or this element or this element all should be equal to 1 over n. So I can make it uh, slightly more formal. You want to select select a number so instead of talking in terms of the actual numbers i can say in terms of this position select a number i between 1 and n uniformly at at random which means picking a specific number i has a probability of 1 over n and call Okay, once I pick a specific number i and call that ith element that is ai, call ai the pivot. Okay, this is the first step. So let me just make a small example here. Uh, imagine that I picked 2, position 2, therefore my pivot is 18. So this is my pivot. Okay. The second step is rearrange rearrange the elements in A around the pivot, uh, rearrange or in other words partition, partition A around the pivot. This is the second step. <coughs> So what I'm going to do for this is the following. As the first step, so once I have selected this pivot, as the first step, what I want to do is this. I want to just move this pivot to a 
to a fixed position for the time being. So let me just take this pivot and move it to the last position and uh, basically move the last element to the position corresponding to the pivot. So all I'm going to, going to do is like make a swap between these two positions. Okay. So therefore, 18 will come here and 47 will come here. So 18 is here and 47 is here. So this is the first step. So now that I have, so I have moved pivot to a safe position and I don't want to touch it for some time. All right, so this is my pivot. Next, what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna kind of compare. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some sort of a scanning of the elements in the left to direction, left to right direction, as well as in the right to left direction, using two pointers, which are initially pointing to this position, that is position one, and the position just before the pivot's position, essentially the last position in the array, excluding the pivot. Okay, so this is a left pointer and this is a right pointer. And here is the invariant I want to maintain. I want the left pointer to be before the right pointer. So the order is going to be like this. And always I want this pointer to point to a smaller number, a number smaller than the pivot. And this one, I want to point to something larger than the pivot. Okay. This is what I want to maintain. And anytime when this rule is violated, I will do some sort of a swap to uh, kind of reinstate the rule. This is what my procedure. So initially, this is pointing to, okay, initially this is like this. It is pointing to a position and I'll have a look at, I'll compare this number with the pivot. Okay, so there are two operations I'm going to do now. One is comparison. Okay, so this is what, these are the two main operations I will be doing. Comparison. Comparison, then swap. And the comparison is always with pivot. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. All right, so the first step is I compare this element with the pivot, which is 18, and I figured out, oh, this number is pointing to something which is which is larger than 64. So that is against my rule. So let's don't do anything. Let's 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 stay there for now. And I will have a look at R. Okay, if this was pointing to something smaller than the pivot, then what I will do is I will you know I will ignore that position and move to the right. So whenever my rule is followed I, this pointer is allowed to move in this direction. Similarly whenever this pointer is pointing to something larger than the pivot, then this guy is allowed to move in this direction and both of them they want to move and come closer to each other and that is how this algorithm works. So anyways, essentially this one is pointing to something larger than the pivot, so, so just wait there. Now I'll have a look at here, is right pointing to something, uh, something good? No, this is pointing to something smaller than the pivot, right? So this guy is also not happy. This guy is also not happy, right? So he has something, he has something which this guy needs and this guy has something which he needs. So what, the, so what can they do? They can just exchange or they can just swap their elements. So make a swap between these two positions, which means 15 will come here and 48 will come here. And now the rule is satisfied. So both these pointers are now happy. And whenever they are happy, they are allowed to move. So now this guy will try to move to the next position, which is 47. And uh, as you can see, 47 is not a good number for this guy. Then uh, I will ask that guy, okay, can you move? Okay, this guy can move. He will come here. And now he is also stuck. 
because he has something which he doesn't want he has something which he doesn't want so what can they do now swap so 8 will come here and 47 will come here okay now now this is this guy's turn so he will move 12 12 is smaller than 18 so happy let me move again 38 38 is larger than uh, the pivot so this guy is stuck now so this guy will see can he move 14 sorry 41 yeah 41 is fine with me let me move again 24 24 is good with me can I move again actually no because I see that this so now these two guys are this is L and this is R right now R does not want to cross L but this guy is not happy at this point because there is a 30, 38 but all the R's are happy these cells are happy except this guy right what can we do at this point there is a pivot lying there so why don't I bring this pivot here and move this 38 there and that's exactly what I'm going to do so 38 so pivot 18 should come here so that way this guy is still happy and 38 will move here okay so this is my pivot all right so now you can see exactly uh, I mean basically we have achieved what we wanted to achieve I wanted to partition the array around the pivot essentially I have 18 here the pivot is here and I have a left sub array let's say a left where everything is smaller than the pivot and I have a right sub array that is AR where everything is larger than the pivot so partition A around the pivot using these two operations into A left and A right this is exactly what we have achieved now and the third step is all you have to do is now sort A left and sort AR recursively basically using the same step sort a left and sort a r recursively okay so that is the end of the algorithm pretty simple okay so what we need to do to now is the analysis and that is the cutest part of QuickSort and uh, before we proceed the analysis I want you to keep two things in mind one thing is how are we selecting this pivot this is uniformly at random so there is equal probability that you will pick any position uh, here and and during this partitioning step the operations which we are doing are comparisons and swaps right and most importantly the comparison is always with the pivot okay so in this example I have never compared 12 and 24 or I have never compared 8 and 41 or 41 and 48 the comparison was always between two numbers where one number is the pivot okay so keep that in mind um, so one last thing I want to mention before we get into the analysis is that select a number i between 1 and n uniformly at random okay so how exactly we do this this thing select a number between unif uh, between 1 and n uniformly at random so for this we assume that let's say the computer already has a function something like rand n which can give you this so the function rand n takes let's say constant amount of time constant time so let's assume that okay we need to make this assumption for pretty much all the um, uh, randomized algorithms and how exactly uh, the how exactly we this function is getting implemented uh, we can ignore the details for now okay for example 
just 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 a just a just a small example if i want to choose between two numbers randomly what i can do is perhaps toss a coin right if i want to choose between two numbers i can toss one coin and you know head and tail these are the two possibilities right so this way i can generate rand 2 uh, if i want to generate let's say rand 6 what I can do is perhaps roll a dice, right? That is one way. Uh, what if I want to generate rand four? I want to generate something between one and four. Perhaps I could toss two coins simultaneously, right? Then these are the possible outcomes: head, 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 tail, tail, head, and tail, tail. Right? There are four possibilities. Right, so this way I can generate rand four. If I want to generate rand eight, I can toss three coins simultaneously, uh, and rand sixteen, four coins, etc., etc. So in some sense, uh, we can kind of generate the rand of any number which is a perfect power of two using this toying coursing. But when something is not a perfect power of two, we need, uh, you know, uh, perhaps more involved techniques. But for our purpose, just don't worry about it. Just assume that this is something which the computer can give you in constant time. Okay, so let's go ahead and see the analysis now. Okay, so we're going to see the analysis of QuickSort. So firstly, in the case of any randomized algorithm, okay, or in the case of any probabilistic analysis in these type of problems, the most trickiest part is in defining the proper random variable. Okay, so once we define a very good random variable, then the rest of it is, you know, perhaps applying the linearity of expectation principle and so on and so forth. So the hardest part is in properly defining the random variable and in the case of QuickSort, so let me define a random variable like this x i j so x i j is a random variable as follows so x i j with i is strictly j less than j okay is a random variable i'm going to define it as one if the i smallest number is compared with the jth smallest number during the during the algorithm during the execution of algorithm okay so in that case this random variable x i j takes the value one and if the ith number and the jth number ith smallest and jth not smallest are not getting compared then the value is zero so zero otherwise so i'm going to define a random variable like this and one thing you have noticed is the main operation we do during quicksort is what we do some comparison and after we do a comparison, we might do a swap, right? So therefore, the total number of operations can be bounded by the total number of comparisons. So the running time, so essentially the running time can be bounded by the number of comparisons. So running time is actually, we want to, between all i and j, we want to sum this quantity. That will give us the running time for all i and for all j greater than i. This is what will give us the... So this will give us the total number of comparisons we have performed during the execution of QuickSort. All right. Therefore,
Okay, so, so the total running time is the same as sum over all values of i and sum over all values of j greater than i xij. This is a total running time. Therefore, the expected running time is equal to the expected running time of this quantity. Okay. And we know a very useful concept called the linearity of expectation, right? Linearity of, of linearity of expectation, which means expectation of the sum of some random variables is the same as the sum of expectations of those random variables. So we can take this sum outside. So that means double sum i j greater than i expectation of x i j. So in other words, the whole thing has boiled down to computing what is expectation of i j. So expectation of i j, ex expectation of x i j is what? This random variable can take two values 1 and 0 so the expectation of x i j g a j is going to be 1 times the probability that x i j is equal to 1 plus 0 multiplied by the probability that expectation of x i j is equal to 0 which is the same as probability of x i j is equal to 1. Okay, so now this is what we need to figure out. Alright, so let's see how to compute that quantity. For that, I want you to focus on something as the follows. How exactly is QuickSort happening? QuickSort is doing things in the following way. It will pick a pivot, one pivot, then it, will, then it will do the partitioning. Then it will pick a pivot for the left subarray and a pivot for the right subarray, right? Then it will do the partitioning again, so on and so forth. So essentially, during the execution of the algorithm, this, um, this algorithm, the QuickSort algorithm will keep on picking some pivots, like many pivots. So let's say P1, P2, P3, etc. denotes the pivots uh, chosen by the algorithm, right? Uh, in the ascending order of the time, uh, they were chosen, okay? So P1 was chosen first, after some time P2 was chosen, after some time P3, etc. This is what is happening. All right. Now I want you to focus on something like a number PK, a special pivot PK as follows. Okay. So essentially PK is a pivot. PK is a pivot, right? So if you look at the numbers in the array, if you look at the numbers, suppose, suppose I I write the numbers in the array in the sorted order. Okay, so sorted, let's say sorted array A looks like this. So the first number, let me call it as A1, A2, A3. You know, at some point of time you have, I don't have enough space here. So suppose, Suppose the sorted array looks like this. I'm not sorting, I just, I'm just showing something for the sake of illustration, where the elements in the array after sorting are like this, let's say A1, A2, A3, dot, dot, dot. After some time you have AI, then you have AJ, then you have the remaining numbers, AN, okay? What I want you to focus is on this region, the numbers from AI to AJ. 
and these are the pivots in the order in which they were picked so so let's assume that this let's say p1 is a pivot which is which is either in this region or in this region okay so so imagine that p1 is a pivot which is in this region that is before ai then what is happening the algorithm will split the original array into two parts where all the numbers which are smaller than the pivot will go to the left side and all the numbers which are larger than the pivot go to the right side so if the first pivot was somewhere here that is before i then both i and j will go to the right side and there is no comparison between i and j and there is no comparison between i and j in that scenario similarly if the first pivot was in this region in this region in this green region okay then again both i and j ai the i smallest and the j smallest will go to the left side and they don't get compared each other right i element and j element will not get compared or xij in that scenario is zero during that step okay so if pi is here or there both ai and both aj are going to be on the same are going to be within the same subarray that's what i want to convince you so let's say that is what happened then after that you got p2 and p2 is let's say another pivot and if p2 is somewhere again here or there it doesn't matter to us okay but what really matters is this let's say we chose p1 p2 p3 etc blah 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 uh, until we reach a pk and suppose pk is the first pivot which is between ai and aj okay so pk pk is the first first pivot first pivot between ai and aj so be very careful pk is the first pivot which falls between these two numbers it could be this number it could be this number or anything between but this is the first time this is happening okay so now i want you to have a careful look what is going to really happen if pi so now that i have expressed this much so essentially this quantity is same as this we established so so there are three possibilities right so pk is the first pivot first pivot between ai and aj okay between ai and aj how many numbers are there i i plus 1 i plus 2 dot 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 j so in so we have j minus i plus 1 different numbers are there all right and this pk can be anything between them right so what if pk is the same as ai if pk is the same as ai which means the pivot i have chosen is ai in that case what will happen is the i th element and j th element will get compared where maybe that is the first time these two elements will get compared right so if pk is equal to ai then xij will be 1 similarly if pk is aj that is a pivot is a last number if the pivot is this number or this number then again the i th smallest and the j th smallest will get compared 
okay so if pk is equal to ai or aj then ai and aj will get compared then xij will be 1 on the other hand if pk is not equal to ai and and pk or in other words if pk is not in ai or aj then xij is equal to 0 Because what really happens is if pk, if pk is something in between, if it is ai or aj, then definitely it will get compared with the other number that is guaranteed because at that point, remember pk is the first time something in this region has become a pivot. That means until that time, both ai and aj were in the same subarray. And the first time when pk is picked, all the numbers in this region will get compared with pk. Now, if PK is either AI or AJ, either AI or AJ, then AI and AJ will get compared. In other words, XIJ will become 1. That is one scenario. And the other scenario is if PK is neither AI nor AJ, that means the pivot is going to be something between them. And what happens at that point is this that, that subarray will get partitioned into two subarrays in such a way that aj will go to the left subarray and ai will go to the right subarray and after that these two elements will never get compared again right because after that these are like two two subarrays and the recursion will happen independently there is no uh, there is no way these two elements are going to meet later on Okay, which means in conclusion, the only case where Xi, where Ai and Aj gets compared is that Pk is either Ai or Aj, where Pk is the first pivot chosen from this range of J minus I plus 1 n numbers. So that means what is the probability that xij equal to 1. What is the probability that xij is equal to 1? You need to pick either ai or aj as the pivot. What of these two? So there are two uh, there are two elements which are in favor of you among these j minus i plus 1 different possibilities. That means this probability is nothing but j minus i plus 1. One. Okay. So that means I have this quantity ready here. So this is same as this, and I already I already got what is that. So now the rest is just uh, simple calculations. All right. So let me go ahead and do the math part. So this will become double sum i j greater than i and expectation of xij is nothing but probability of xij is equal to 1 which now we have computed as double sum i j greater than i 2 divided by j minus i plus 1 okay so now let me just expand this sum the outside i will keep the same okay so j has to grow from i plus 1 to n right the smallest element is going to be i plus 1 so if i substitute i plus 1 here anyway 2 i can take outside so if i substitute j as i plus 1 first then this will become 1 over 2 
then if I substitute j as i plus 2 then this will become 1 over 3 and the last quantity j can be as large as n so the last thing will become n minus i plus 1 so n minus i plus 1 and if you look here this is I mean if I had a plus 1 then this is harmonic series and I know that the harmonic series will sums up to log n to the base e so therefore I can roughly write this as 2 times sigma uh, or all i log of n minus i plus 1 okay log of n minus i plus 1 and if I do the summation there for i is equal to 1 to n so the first the first value become 2 times log uh, log n the next is log n minus 1 log n minus 2 the last quantity is going to be log um, something like log 1 and the whole thing there are n terms here so therefore this is bounded by 2 n log where log is to the base e n. okay which is nothing but big of n log n so this is the running time this is the expected running time of quicksort Okay, so just to summarize what we have, we already saw the QuickSort algorithm and its analysis. This is a Las Vegas type randomized algorithm, which means uh, we will always get the correct output. The expected number of comparisons or the expected running time is n log n, which is good. However, the worst case running time is n squared, which means there is still a small probability in which we will end up in spending a quadratic amount of work a quadratic amount of running time so what we are interested at this point is can we somehow bound the probability of you know running into this kind of bad scenarios okay for that what i'm going to show you is the following result can i do something like this the probability that my actual running time Let's say my actual running time is more than some factor, let's say factor C, C times my expected running time, my expected running time is 2n log. Can you somehow give a bound on this? And the answer is yes, I can bound it by 1 over C. Okay. And this bounds comes from what is known as Markov's inequality. Markov's which says the following that it says the following the probability the probability that any random variable takes greater than or equal to a value a is bounded by expectation of x divided by a which essentially means the probability that x takes more than or greater than or equal to some constant times the expected value is less than or equal to 1 over c essentially you replace a with c times ex and you will get the second result and that is exactly what i have applied here okay if you want to see the proof what we can do is it's pretty easy what is expectation of x expectation of x is uh, for all values of i i multiplied by the probability that x equal to i right which you can write as the following 
expectation of let's say all values of i less than or equal to uh, less than all values of i less than a less than a uh, multiplied by p of x is equal to i plus i greater than or equal to a i multiplied by probability of x equal to i okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to ignore the first quantity so when i ignore the first quantity i should write like this okay should write like this then here the pro this quantity i i is going i has to go from 1 to from a to all the numbers above a therefore this quantity i can write like this sigma sigma so this quantity is equal to okay so this quantity is equal to instead of this i I can replace with all of these i's with a. So in other words, let me write like this. This quantity is greater than or equal to, I can replace all of this i with a, right? Something smaller than i. Therefore, I can write like this i greater than or equal to a probability of x is equal to i and this sum i can write like a multiplied by probability of x is greater than or equal to a now with this and this you will get this result okay so that is markov's inequality so all i have done is applied this and got this result. Okay, so we have a guarantee, probabilistic guarantee on the running time. Okay, so therefore this is a Las Vegas algorithm which will give us the correct output always. What I want to show next is a small trick which we can apply to this, uh, I mean our QuickSort algorithm or in fact to any uh, Las Vegas algorithm to convert it into a what is known as the Monte Carlo algorithm. So, so I want to convert the Las Vegas algorithm in hand to a Monte Carlo algorithm. Okay. So, as you recall, Las Vegas means uh, the final answer is always going to be correct. And the algorithm will always give us a correct answer, but the running time could be unbounded, right? So all we can say is an expected guarantee on the running time. But on the other hand, Monte Carlo algorithm should give us a worst case runtime. However, the probability is associated with the probability of whether we will get the final answer or, answer or not. Right? Whether we will get the final correct answer. I mean, sometimes it could give us an answer which could be even wrong. Right? Sometimes it may not even give us an answer. That is what is Monte Carlo algorithm. So I'm just showing you a small trick so that this can be converted to this. And again, we need to make sure that the probability of 
you know, this algorithm making a mistake is really, really small. <coughs> All right, so how to do this? And here is a step. Here is a step. So first thing I want to notice is this. If I fix the value of C as two, okay, that means the probability that this algorithm takes twice the time with respect to the expected runtime is less than 50 percentage. So here is my new Monte Carlo algorithm, okay? Here is my new Monte Carlo algorithm and this is what I'm gonna do. So first, you run a uh, sort and keep a keep a counter on the number of comparisons number of, um, keep a counter on the number of comparisons then if the algorithm if the algorithm terminates with within two times within two times 2n log e to the n steps okay so here this is nothing but the expected runtime okay if the algorithm actually finishes within twice the number of expected runtime uh, when you have the answer then simply output the answer and and stop do nothing okay then you are done on the other hand else else means you have run the algorithm but it is taking more than two times the expected else simply about else simply about and repeat basically you repeat you repeat this process that says c over two times so here is the algorithm okay so all i have done now is this I have taken a 2 and this is multiplied by the expected runtime. I just fixed a number 2, okay? There is nothing special about 2, but I fixed something which is larger than 1. <clears throat> uh, then I just ran the algorithm and I waited for twice the amount of expected runtime. If I am getting an answer, good, I am done. If I don't get an answer, okay, forget about this execution, restart do it again wait until two times the expected runtime do i have an answer if yes output and i'm done if i don't have an answer just abort this execution and restart so you keep doing this thing as many as c over two times c divided by two times i have a reason why i chose this so this two c over two and uh, let's see how this algorithm works so what is the running time of my monte carlo algorithm running time of let's say my monte carlo version of quicksort is c over 2 times 2 times the expected value right which is simply c times the expected value c times the expected runtime now what i'm really interested in is what is the probability of success when i am defining success as like if if i if, if i get a final output i call it as a success if i get the correct final output i call it as a success the probability of success is nothing but the probability of failure right 
And what, am, what I have done here is I have repeated, I have ran this algorithm repeatedly as many as c over 2 times. And my overall algorithm is a failure if and only if all of my you know, c over 2 executions were failures, right? If any of it was a success, then I would have got the correct answer and I would have been happy. But unfortunately, this could happen, right? All of my C over 2 executions could be wrong. But what is the probability of that happening, right? So probability of failure is that all of my execution, my first execution is also wrong. Let me just call it as P1. My second execution is also a failure. Third is also a failure. Up to all of my C over 2 executions were failure, which is nothing but 1 minus Right? I can bound it like this, 1 minus the probability that any fixed execution will take more than twice the amount of time is less than half. C is equal to 2. Therefore, each of these values I can bound by half, which means this raised to C over 2. Okay? So what have I achieved by this? I got a new algorithm with running time c times c, but the probability of failure is something like this, half raised to c over 2. And this is a Monte Carlo algorithm. So as a final remark, what if I ask this question? I have only a fixed amount of time with me. Okay, I have only a fixed amount of running time. So which algorithm should I run? Right? Which algorithm should I run? That is a question. So which algorithm should I run to maximize the probability of success? So let me just assume that when I say I have a fixed total time, that means I want to fix this time okay so my total time is fixed that is c times c okay i have only that much time within this i can do whatever i want but i need to make sure that my algorithm is successful so the problem this algorithm will will give you the correct output but there is a small risk of 1 over c. There is a 1 over c probability that this algorithm will not finish in this time. So time is fixed. Fixed time to c times expected. So c times expected value, you fix it. So the first algorithm has a 1 over c probability that it has not found the output yet. So this is a failure probability of the first algorithm. However, the second algorithm will finish running, right? This algorithm will finish the execution in this much time. However, there is a probability that it doesn't have the answer yet, right? So this has 1 over 2 is to c over 2. And what I want you to do is just compare these two and figure out which one is good. Right? What if the value of C is let's say 10? Right? When value of C is 10, this has a 10 percentage chance of failure. However, this has half raised to 5. Right? That is 1 over 32. This has roughly 3 percentage chance of failure. So clearly this is better for c is equal to 10. What happens when c is equal to 20? So this is 1 over 20 that is like 5 percentage chance, 5 percentage chance of failure. However here this is half raised to 20 by 2 that is half raised to 10 that is 1 over 1000 which means 0.1 percentage chance of failure right 
what if c is equal to 100 what is c is 100 this has one percentage chance of failure this is half raised to 50 2 raised to 50 is what 2 raised to 20 is a million 2 raised to 30 is a billion so 2 raised to 50 is a million times a billion right so the probability of failure in that case is 1 in a billion times a million right that probability is much much smaller than the chance of somebody winning a you know a big lottery right so which means this is a nice trick which we can apply to many of the las vegas algorithm to boost you know to boost the probability of success right we are kind of like skew like really skewing down the probability of failure like really making this small okay so that was the final remark and this is a trick which you can apply to any algorithm